And coming up next, video games. Are they really harmless entertainment for kids? We talk to a documentary filmmaker who says they're designed to be addictive. Stay with us. There are some out... Welcome back. Well, it may be difficult to pick the right Christmas present for some people, but if you have children, there's a good chance they'll want the same thing. Video games. Video game sales have skyrocketed over the last few years, and it's hard to watch television without seeing ads for what's billed as the latest, greatest game. But more critics are saying there's a dark side to the video game craze. Some kids seem to take their love of video games too far. The games become their biggest interest in life, and some experts say there's a danger of them becoming isolated from family and peers. Others worry about the level of violence in some of the games. Over the course of an evening, a child could kill dozens of imaginary people while playing some of the top-selling games. What's the effect of pretending to slaughter people day in and day out? Those are just some of the questions Brent Stafford set out to examine in a video documentary that's just been released. Stafford is a camera operator and television producer. He made the documentary as his master's thesis in communications at Simon Fraser University. Video games are extremely fun. It would be very problematic for us to suggest that video games is, are something that we can get rid of because there's no way that we'll get rid of them. They're extremely fun and kids really enjoy them and as parents who are, you know, grow up and who are kid, used to be kids who play video games, uh, it's just going to mean that more video games are going to become even more integrated into our culture. So video games are fun, we can't get rid of them, so we have to address any concerns we have about video games from that approach that they're not going away. So you've just finished uh, your master's thesis on this. Why did you decide to do it in the form of a, a documentary as opposed to the, the sort of usual 300-page dissertation? Video games are an extremely powerful communication medium. And they are that because they incorporate so many aspects of previous media. They, they are extremely visual. The sound is there. The narrative and story structure is extremely intricate and, and so forth. So if you want to comment on video games, you really need to show the video games. And you really need to show people playing because so much of the interaction that people have with video games is written all over their face when they're deadpan and they're lost in the zone. So when these kids are playing the games, when they're engrossed, where do, where do they go exactly? Well, the zone is it. Without the zone, there's no game. Anybody who's ever played a video game has felt the zone because if you don't fall into a zone, then you're going to put the control pad down and you're going to stop playing because the game is boring. So the zone is, a, the, zone is the desired, it's the digital nirvana of video gaming. And when games are designed, they're designed to find that proper mix of ingredients to pull a kid's ma imagination into the game and to hold that kid there as long as they can. So when you talk to a gamer, they talk about being in the zone. It is a state of nirvana for them where they tune out everything else around them in terms of the physical world and reality and they absorb their psyche into the game where every movement, every reaction, every twitch and flicker of their eye and their finger is, is attached to this virtual reality. So this, this zone, is it a healthy place for kids to be? Is it good for them? Well, the zone is a, is a state of deep concentration and people experience this zone in, in, in lots of different aspects in their life, in sports and, and in work and so forth. I mean, this idea of completely engrossing and losing your, yourself in, in, in a construct is not, is not particularly specific to video games. But what we have to remember, though, is that video games have a very powerful play experience that um, kids interact with. And what becomes problematic is when that play experience might incur certain kind of behavior or certain kind of thinking and so forth. So that makes that the, the social norms and values and stuff that are communicated when a kid's in that zone more problematic. It's very important to know. Video game developers, when they're making a, when they're making a game, they'll really readily admit and tell you that what they're looking for is that perfect balance of ingredients that create what, what's called the ingredients of compulsion. They'll tell you they like to make games that are addictive. Right? They like to be addicted to games, like any good game player would. Right? So games are designed to be addictive in a way that they're compelling. They're designed to have increasing intensity and stuff like that, which keep, keep, forever keeps a kid on the edge of his seat or her seat. Right? So 
addictive addictive video games is part of is, is it. If a game wasn't addictive and didn't keep you in the zone, the game's not a success and the kid would stop playing. So the kids disappear. They play these games for hour after hour after hour. What sort of an effect does that have on, on the family uh, dynamic? In terms of in the household, we find that, and kids will readily admit this, that they don't listen to their parents as much because they're lost into the zone. And their parents will be yelling up, you know, take out the garbage or come down for dinner or do your homework. And the kids tuned right out. So that obviously causes some tension within the household. Uh, the other thing is that kids will tell you they, they give up other activities in their lives to play video games. Some, the, some diehard gamers truly know that. Others know it but don't admit it. And, and it's a simple fact. They know that they are playing too much, too many, too many video games. But the fact is, though, is that for kids that are like that, generally they are already isolated in some manner when it comes to their peer relationships and so forth. So the video game becomes a friend to them, and it becomes somebody that they're interacting with. So it's a vicious cycle because the more you gain, the less you're out there with peers, the less you're out there doing other activities, doing healthy sports and all that kind of stuff. And because you're doing that less, you gravitate more to the video game because it's a world that you at least have some control over and you f feel familiar with. So there's a lot of violent games out there, there's a lot of non-violent games out there, but there's a distinction within the violent games too. And uh, the first person shooter games uh, upset a lot of people. Uh, Describe what this first-person shooter uh, game is like, because that does seem perhaps even more troubling than, than the other violent games. The first-person shooter game, in terms of violent games, is one of the most violent. It's one of the most enjoyable games for people to play, and it's the most intense, and you're going you're gonna to rack up the most kills in a first-person shooter game. And what a first-person shooter game basically is, is a game where the player does not see a representation of themselves as a character in the game. All they see is what looks like looking down a barrel of a gun. So the entire play experience is in this 3D world where all you've got is diff different kinds of guns. You've got a shotgun, you've got a handgun, you've got chainsaws, you might be punching or you have a knife. So all you witness, the entire play experience, is mediated by just this one view of you being the person that's going through this 3D world and killing people. That's what a first-person shooter game is. So do you think there's a connection between the violent video games and the stories that we're seeing played out in Littleton, Colorado, or Tabor? Is there a connection between violence in video games and some of the violent acts we're seeing? I think it's fair to say that violence in video games is contributing to the virus of violence that's sort of f filtering through our culture. And I think why we can say that is because clearly for troubled kids who uh, may be isolated in their lives or who have behavior problems, the repeated experience of killing must be having some kind of an effect. Now, why is that effect greater in video games than it might be with television or film? That's because the interactive, in, the interactive experience with a video game creates a greater intensity that you don't have when you passively watch television or film. So when a kid's playing a violent game, certainly a first-person shooter game, it's the kid that's deciding to kill. It's the kid that's pulling the trigger. So the interactive experience makes it more problematic than if you were just sitting there watching television or Arnold Schwarzenegger in a movie. You talk to kids about the games, you talk to parents about the games. Uh, what sort of a coping strategy do you think parents should have when it comes to video games in the, in the home? Definitely read the boxes on the video games. Definitely look at the voluntary codes of conduct or the voluntary uh, rating system that the industry has. But the most important piece of advice I could give to parents would be to monitor their children's gaming. And that's not in the first five minutes of their gaming. You buy a kid a new game, what you have to do is you have to take a look at the play experience that the game has, that is offered, offered to the kid, two weeks into the game. Video games are layered. They're designed to become increasingly more intense. They're designed to become increasingly more uh, violent. So what you need to do is you need to, you need to basically take a look at them after a week or so of your child playing the game because then you started to advance into the more gore or, or the more intricate sort of fantasy. And then you can really truly get a sense of what kind of game your child's playing. And then make a decision based on that. What we have to do as a culture when it comes to video games is to realize that video games are no longer a toy. 
video games are not a toy. Video games are an extremely powerful communication medium that basically have usurped the power of television and film and radio because it's a synergistic, interactive kind of a medium. So in terms of dealing with video games as a problem in our lives, we have to first no longer think of them as just an entertainment vehicle. The other thing we need to remember about video games is that video game developers, when they're designing a game, they have all their marketing strategies already figured out when they're making the game. So look at Pokemon. Pokemon has 150 different characters in it, so there can be 150 different cards. It has 150 different characters, so there can be 150 different dolls. And the, all the marketing strategies of the movie and all that kind of stuff is designed when the game is being designed. So that's what makes it, video games so sinister in a way in terms of their marketing strategies, because every aspect of their marketing has been thought out Every avenue of synergy between all the other kinds of media that video games can bring into their product happens at the point of conception when it comes with the video game. And that's what makes their ability to target to kids so strong and what makes it a $17 billion a year business. And we're going to continue our look at video games and violence next week. Uh, we'll talk with someone who is considerably less concerned about the violence in the game. Ron Bertram is with Nintendo Canada. He thinks the games are social. They create a common currency for kids. And uh, he's not all that concerned okay. about, uh, about the violence in the games.